Uh, good to be with you. The, uh, I was honored that uh, Leslie invited me. Um, she's invited me a couple of times before other places to, to speak, and so it's an honor to be here with you. And This is quite an event you're putting on here. Uh, the reason that I got interested in this and wrote this book, this is the fourth book that I've written on uh, local history, was because uh, my family's been in Hall County going back about 200 years. As a matter of fact, uh, they moved in there about a year before they formed the county, so it was Cherokee Territory. Uh, when they moved right on the Jackson, what was then the Jackson County line. When they formed Hall County, it was formed uh, partially from Cherokee ceded land and also from uh, uh, part of uh, then Jackson County. As a matter of fact, my four times great grandfather, who was a Revolutionary War veteran, and uh, his son, who, was, who served with Buffington, whose name is also John, um, when they formed the county in 1818, they ran the county line between Hall and Jackson right between them, even though they lived across the road from each other. So in 1820, one was in Hall, one was in Jackson. Uh, so I got interested in that. And of course, over the years doing research, I've been doing genealogical research and other research for 40-something years, I guess. And I discovered that my three times great grandfather, whose name was John Laddie, John Canita Laddie, senior, was uh, in Buffington's company when they removed the Cherokee. And uh, that he uh, was, he helped build Fort Buffington in Cherokee County. When he enlisted in Buffington's company uh, on Christmas Day of 1837, he was almost 60 years old, and the maximum age was supposed to be 45. I don't know why that was, other than the fact that he and Captain Buffington were neighbors and close friends and did business together. And uh, Captain Buffington had had so much trouble with in the first service with the young militiamen. I think he may have uh, enlisted some of these older men to help him control them. Uh, they were always, these young soldiers, as young soldiers do, were always getting into something. My wife refers to it as testosterone poisoning, by the way. And uh, so I got to looking at, at researching this, and I, didn't, I never thought there'd be enough information that I could collect from about this small company from Hall County uh, to write a little book about. But then I came across Stephen Neal Dennis, uh, the great uh, researcher that uh, works with Dr. Hill and uh, he directed me to an awful lot of information for, you know, uh, original documents in the National Archives. So I spent uh, uh, quite a bit of time there over the years, and I put together this little book. It's pretty fascinating. Now, what I tell people is I don't, uh, I just report the facts I try to. I don't consider myself an author. I consider myself a compiler of the information. Uh, I spent most of my life uh, in law enforcement working major crimes in uh, homicide cases, and I kind of do a historical book like I did a homicide case. I try to be as detailed as possible, make sure the facts are verifiable from the record, and uh, then try to put it together sort of in chronological order. And I rely mostly on them and what they thought and what they expressed. It's not important what I think. Um, so that's what I have here, and I'll go through it. I know y'all have probably been at it for a while, and it's getting close to supper time, so I'll try to go through this fairly quickly. You can find a pile of flint, because they lost flints constantly. They broke all the time. They lost a lot of other things, too. And this is just having to do with Fort Buffington being an armory. Uh, crossing the high tower, this is uh, uh, this covers a period of time. As you see there, it says May 1838. This is when they were moving back and forth, moving Indians back and forth across the river. Um, and then the last entry there is the 93 men of Captain Buffington's company on the march to New Echota. That would have been July the 2nd. Of 1838, they arrived at New Echota on the third and were mustered out, uh, and so that's uh, where he was paid the the ferryman, a man named Donaldson. And if you've ever if you've ever looked for that, there's uh, the that ferry was across the Etowah there. I can't remember what the, that highway is that crosses right there, right below Williams Barbecue. Some of you live over there, Cherokee. Highway 5 goes by William. If you cross the river down there, got a large bridge. You, if you turn right and go down in there, there's some uh, businesses, some industry, and the ferry was right there. And if you go across the highway and up on the hill, there's a street up there named Donaldson for the ferryman. Um, so they still know where that location is. Now they just put in some uh, compiled service records. Um, this one here, Caleb B. Smith, I put him in there because when he mustered out, he'd lost his bayonet. They charged him 144 cents for his bayonet. 
And he charged Count Buffett three cents for a side plate that he had lost. And there were no favorites, plenty of favorites here. And then the other two men, uh, Nimrod Dean, I think those are great old names, D Nimrod Dean and Robert Jarrett died. One on April the 3rd of 37, one on March the 5th of 37. Uh, apparently knew each other. I couldn't find a record of, of their burials or anything like that, so I don't know where, where they went homesick and died or where they died there and they carried their bodies back, I don't know, or where they buried them somewhere around uh, New Echota. And this is the uh, compiled service record of my ancestor and uh, where he uh, mustered in on Christmas Day of 1837. Uh, they had two musters. He was uh, home on leave for the second one. He was there for the third one, then he mustered out at New Echota on July the 3rd. Uh, he didn't get charged for that key, so I guess he must have had it hid somewhere. I don't know how he got it. I guess he kept it. Um, this is his bounty, his second bounty land warrant. The first one, he got 80 acres and sold it. They changed the law, he got another 80 acres. He died before he uh, executed it. Uh, so it has his name on it there. You probably can't make it out in the number. And he, uh, he died in May of 1856, uh, still having this warrant. So he had his youngest son, he had 12 children, his youngest son, was a minor at the time he served, so he was authorized to get that property. It took him 30 years to get it, and he got it in, outside of Fort Payne, Alabama. And he lived and died there, visited his grave there. Um, when you go and look at the bounty land claims in the National Archives, they'll bring them out one at a time in files. They're usually one or two sheets of paper after they before they sign up. When they brought my ancestors out, it was over two inches thick. You're talking about a decided fellow. It was just full of information I never seen the like because of them trying to get this land. I even discovered in his bounty land file that one of my three times great grandmothers was a midwife. She used the French term, whatever that is, I can't remember now, and uh, delivered my great great grandfather. Well his mother delivered him, she assisted. And uh, she was the midwife that attended my great 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 grandmother when some of her children were born. And I found it here. Fascinating. Because she said, heck yeah, I remember when he was born. I was there, I helped. She gave the exact date, November 1836. And there, I didn't bring it with me, but there's a photograph of the key. Uh, it's uh, in a safe place at my house. Quite a prized possession. It, these were locks were called bridge ward locks. They were invented by an Englishman in 1830. They replaced the old skeleton keys and locks because they were real easy to pick. And this is much more complicated. They're large locks. You see how big the thing weighs nearly a pound. And uh, for the, I'd seen this key many times and didn't think anything about it, didn't know what it was. And uh, finally, I have an elderly aunt, and they're almost 100 years old, and she gave it to me and uh, told me how it could, had come down through the family. Uh, so that's uh, maybe the only artifact in existence of Fort Buffington. And. Uh, I did tell Dr. Hill that if she ever does that archaeological dig and that they set up a little museum over there, we'll talk. But in the meantime, that's the only thing I possess that I know of that belonged to my ancestor. And he stole it probably. I don't know if he... I have it. I think the statute of limitations. Couldn't prove it. And I added that because I consulted folks in the Trail Tears Association about... Uh, uh, and they, they showed me this key that was recovered. The guy that recovered it was in the last group. He said he was involved in that work uh, at Fort Payne. So that was some of the further evidence that that indeed was the type keys and locks that they were using. I was looking for all the confirmation I could get. Uh, recently discovered records, I won't go into that. I'm always, the thing about writing a book, if any of you ever have a book on history, is that people contact you afterward after they've read it and they have all this information and photographs that you wished you'd had. And uh, so that, that happens here. As a matter of fact, that information came to me from a guy that was at New Echota that day when we was over there. And he came out and said, hey, uh, this guy was, yeah. No, it wasn't, it wasn't the one that got up and heckled me. It wasn't him. No, it was another fellow. I got heckled over there a little bit. Uh, and I added this. This is something else I wish I'd have known when I wrote the book. In the book, I have four biographies at the end as as a addendum. Uh, of course, my ancestor, Captain Buffington, Pickens T. Reynolds, and a guy named Jacob Pettyjohn. 
Jacob Pettyjohn was the most interesting fellow. He uh, ran away from home and enlisted in a militia company called the Gainesville Dragoons. They went to Florida and fought the, Cher the Seminoles. Uh, his daddy tried to recover him and he kept getting away from him. He wound up in Buffington's company as a 16-year-old and he, believe it or not, when he, he stole from somebody and slipped their saddlebags and got their money, it was Pickens T. Reynolds. He stole $30 out of Pickens T. Reynolds' saddlebags. Pickens T. Reynolds was still mad about it in 1892, by the way. He said, yeah, he knew Petty John. He was just a sorry thief, was all he was. Well, Petty John, he must have been a pretty rough guy. He's a huge guy. I found a description of him. Was involved in a murder in Forsyth County in 1858. He and some other men stabbed a man by the name of... Uh, Clayton Vaughn to death. Uh, in the 1890s, his widow applied for a pension. And of course, she didn't get it because they didn't know what became. They didn't know if Petty John was living or dead. And so she never got it. Uh, turns out <laughs> that in 1887, they found him at Tahlequah. Uh, and so this article appeared in the Atlanta Constitution, August 1887. Uh, and said a telegram from Tahlequah Indian Territory announces the arrest in that city of Jacob Pettyjohn. He was 70-something years old by that time. Now, I, I'm still researching that. I'm still working on that because I don't, still don't have an answer. He was not hanged. He'd been sentenced to be hanged. And they put him in the jail there. And he got him a lawyer. And uh, they filed a motion and got him out, got a new trial, and bonded him out. So he went to Texas as probably I would if I was in that situation. There's a rope waiting for me. And they, never, they said they never heard from him again. I think everybody lied. I think his wife lied in her pension application file. I think that her lawyer lied and because uh, they probably knew where he was all the time. Uh, so I'm still looking into that. I don't think, I'm pretty sure they never hanged him. I don't think they ever got him back to Georgia, as a matter of fact. I think he stayed in the Indian Territory. So uh, just a little side light there. You, you know, you can just keep adding to these things, these colorful characters. So as you see, Amazon.com, 977 and 399 shipping and handling, five dollars, mere five dollars. <laughs> Does anybody have a question I could answer for you? Yes, ma'am. Are the compiled service records on Soul Three? Um those are not. Uh they are for war between the states, but uh they're not for these there you still have to go to the archives and look at the originals okay thank you i hired somebody to do that because you can only look at a certain number a day and it, i found it cheaper to hire they got some great researchers there and i found it easier to hire somebody to do that for me than make a trip up there but now those folks at uh, i had a great time at the national archives those folks there if, if you come in there and you're prepared you know what you're looking for and you're prepared you don't waste a lot of their time uh, and they know you're serious, they'll do all kinds of things for you. So they would, they would bend the rules for me all the time to let me look at more material while I was there. And on one occasion, since I was looking for these original documents, uh, and I didn't know the box number, uh, they came and got me and took me back into the stacks. Now, most people, that wouldn't mean a thing to, but if you've done a lot of research to be taken into the stacks by the people at National Archives and allowed to help them, assist them look for a box, that tells you two things. One, they believe you're a serious researcher. And two, uh, they uh, trust you. And uh, so that was, for me, that's a great experience. My wife just shakes her head and says, I do not understand. And I said, well, you can't understand everything. Everybody's different. Did anybody else have a question? Yes, sir. Um, I noticed you didn't say anything about it during this time. I don't know if your book even mentions it. But the Cherokee has sovereignty that they won in the Supreme Court in, That's 19, right. in 1832. Yes. It's and, in the book. And most of the stuff that you're talking about was illegal. Yes. According to that. I mean, I don't I don't know if you touched on that aspect of it or not because it, it it seems like that it's a it's a justification for what happened with the Cherokee. Yeah. When it was complete, I mean, the Cherokees had sovereignty. That's correct. To be there and to, and to not have any state law forced upon them, but yet you have, you know, you've documented really well how many people that had just kind of like overlooked that and just... Yeah. There's, uh, there's uh, it's in the book, there are three different Supreme Court cases involving the Cherokee and the sovereignty of the Cherokee Nation. And I touch on all of them in the book. And, and I quote some people who are much more knowledgeable than I am on the law that discuss that. Uh, 
George Corn Tassel was was hanged in Hall County, uh, and he had been the uh, U.S. Supreme Court had been petitioned and had sent down an order uh, putting an end to his execution. He was in jail in, Cher in Gwinnett County. The governor of Georgia ordered the sheriff of Hall County to bring him to Hall County and hang him immediately so that the Supreme Court could not do anything to prevent it. So they brought George Corn Tassel from Gwinnett County to Hall County and hanged him. And we now in Gainesville every year have a Corn Tassel Festival. That's where, the, that's where it came from. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but what was happening was there was a struggle between the federal government and state, Georgia state government. And uh, the people who were in charge, the governor and so forth, uh, of Georgia state government at the time simply said, Supreme Court, they can rule whatever they want to. We're not going to do it. And they were determined to uh, remove Cherokee sovereignty from Georgia, which they did. So it's all in the book. They would, uh, there were several Cherokee who were executed. They would execute them summarily. I mean, there had been a trial and all, but to prevent the federal government from intervening. That's absolutely correct. And so that was what these cases were about. Whether or not the Cherokee were a sovereign nation, the Supreme Court would go back and forth, you know, in what their position was. Thank you. Appreciate bringing that up. That's, that's, this is an example of where if you just decide, and it's being done today, I don't want to get political here, but it's being done today. The, the, the rulings of the federal courts and the constitutions are being ignored every day by, by people in power. And that's what was going on here, especially on the state level. This is, by the way, I'll get to you. This is where, if you're familiar with the famous quote from by Andrew Jackson. Now, he was uh, famously quoted as having said, uh, Chief Justice Tawney has his rule, and now let us see him enforce it. He didn't really say that, and I correct that in the book. What he said was, Chief Justice Tony has his ruling, but it's still born, saying it's already dead. Nobody's going to enforce it. I'm not going to enforce it. He's President of the United States. So he was saying, I don't care what the Supreme Court says. We're not going to do it. We're going to remove the Cherokee. And that's what they did. But now, as I said at the outset, I, use, I, you know, I just report what I find from the record. I, I try to stay out of the debate, even though I enjoy discussing it. Uh, about you know who's right and who's wrong and what's good and what's bad. Um, it is a historical fact, and I like to know as much about it as I can. And by the way, in the epilogue of the book, I touch on the fact I'm a member of a Southern Baptist church in Hall County. I'm a deacon there. My son's a pastor of one. In the Chattahoochee Baptist Association, when it was formed in 1826 in Hall County, one of the founded churches was a church called Tinsawati in the Cherokee Nation. Now they had a white pastor, but everybody else in the church were Cherokee. Every year, that, that man whose name was, was O'Brien would come to the associational meetings and he would bring his Cherokee deacon with him. In 1832, when they had the annual meeting, they were down one church. The explanation was the Tinsawati Church have decided to remove to Arkansas. Now, when the, I've heard stories of growing up all my life that when they removed to Arkansas, they took all the artifacts, all the things, symbols in their church with them to what was then the Arkansas Territory. It's in Oklahoma now. By the way, that church still exists out there today. It's the Liberty Baptist Church. And uh, so these, you know, they were living together. They were intermarrying. They were working together, worshiping together. Uh, but the Tinsawati Church, for whatever reason, decided that they would voluntarily move west. Now, O'Brien, the white pastor, went with them. He died there. His gravestone is still there. And uh, his children were baptized by a Cherokee pastor, by the way. I wrote, I've written some on him. Duncan O'Brien? Duncan O'Brien. O'Brien. It was with a T. Any other question? Yes, ma'am. Well, it only did because they were willing to flaunt federal law. And I mean, they, yeah, that's true. They, they saw themselves, you know, it's like the great Shelby Foote said. Prior to the war between the states, we would say the United States are. After the war, since then, we say the United States is. They did, they, the, to them at that time, the state and state sovereignty and state law 
they identified with that far more than they did with the collective government. Uh, you know, Robert E. Lee, when he was offered command of the Union armies, said never against Virginia. I'll never raise my sword against Virginia. Virginia was more important to him than the United States. So that's how they viewed it. And so if, they, if you're willing to flaunt the law, you can. It, we see it happening now. Being flaunted every day if you're not paying attention. Thank you. Thank you.